Good morning and welcome to Climate Matters, your monthly sustainability radio show brought to you by the City of Santa Fe. I'm Neil Denton and we come to you every month to talk to you about sustainability and resilience in, in and around Santa Fe. Uh, this month, we're gonna be talking about what's going on at the Roundhouse. The New Mexico legislature just convened and uh, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on. And to help me with that conversation, I'm joined by Gary Payton with the Coalition of Sustainable Communities, New Mexico. Good morning, Gary. Good morning, Neil. It's good to be with you again. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks for joining me on the show again. We're um, so glad to be a part of the Coalition of Sustainable Communities, New Mexico, so that we can work with people like yourself to better understand what's going on uh, at the Roundhouse. So um, why don't we start by just telling the listeners what the Coalition of Sustainable Communities, New Mexico is? Well, our coalition is a membership organization that consists of the elected officials and officers and staff persons like you in sustainability offices from the city of Santa Fe, Santa Fe County, the city of Albuquerque, Las Cruces, and Los Alamos County. So these five organizations and their elected leaders uh, constitute uh, the elected officials over about 42% of the population of the state of New Mexico. So we think we have a role in being able to advocate for important pieces of legislation as they deal with climate action and sustainability and as they move through the legislature. Well, we certainly appreciate the leadership of the coalition and uh, you know the involvement of getting that Community Solar Act, Act passed this last year. It's gonna help a lot of Santa Feans access uh, renewable energy. Uh, those who can't put it on their rooftop or on their property will be able to subscribe to uh, offsite renewables. So i um, really glad the coalition was such a leader in that effort. And i um, glad to have you here to talk about what to expect in this 30 day session. Um, so for perhaps for people who don't understand, you know, we go back and forth between a 60 day session and a 30 day session. Um, so, so what happens in a 30 day session, Gary? Well, the, a 30-day session is uh, called for in the Constitution of the state of New Mexico, and it is primarily focused upon building the budget. So the principal task that the House and Senate uh, people right now have in front of them is put together the, the budget that can finance state operations beginning in, on the 1st of July 2022, which is fiscal year 2023. So that's their primary task. But beyond that responsibility for building the budget. They also hear pieces of legislation. Uh, as an example, uh, coming forward are uh, literally dozens and dozens of bills. Uh, as of account at the early part of this week, over 350 bills had already been introduced by senators and representatives. However, they have to meet the criteria of being judged germane because this is a budget related 30 day session that generally means they have some specific budget piece in there that has to be dealt with overall. The other pieces of the way legislation can move forward in this session is the governor has the opportunity to be able to lift up to the legislators those subjects that are most important to her and to her administration. There are three major pieces that have been advanced that deal with environment and climate that we'll be talking about here this morning. The other piece that uh, create, is, is created for a, a session like this is that constitutional amendments can be brought forward by uh, House members or by Senate members. And if they clear both houses, they do not go to the governor, but rather they go directly to the citizens of the state of New Mexico, and we would see them on the upcoming November 2022 ballot. So those are the uh, uh, the broad outlines of uh, the kind of actions that move forward in a focused 30-day session. And this session started um, last Tuesday, right? It started on Tuesday, the 18th of January, and it will conclude at noon, a stroke of noon, uh, on February the 17th. A little over three weeks from now. And so we're already in the throes of that session. Bills are being introduced. Bills are being deemed germane, as you put it. Probably uh, the only time in our lives many of us use that word. But uh, as you <laughs> pointed out, that means it's uh, it's deemed appropriate for this 30-day session because it has a budget implication. Um, and I, I guess those amendments to the Constitution are an exception to that budget implication. And there is an amendment to the New Mexico Constitution being brought forward in this session 
the Green Amendment. Um, what's going on with the Green Amendment, Gary? Well, the Green Amendment was uh, an effort to be able to put forward the Green Amendment happened in the 2021 session, but it's really gotten up in a, a push for uh, hearing in this uh, legislative short session in 2022. Uh, let's let's step back a little bit. Okay. Uh, our New Mexico Constitution was ratified in 1912, 109 years ago. And over the course of these decades, it's been amended about 70 times. So this is a, a, a mechanism by which uh, the broad constitutional protections that we have uh, can be improved and updated uh, as the years go by. So specifically, uh, the conversation about the Green Amendment would add to our Bill of Rights. We know that in our Constitution, we have a right to bear arms, we have a right to free elections, we have a right to freedom of religion, trial by jury, etc. But the Green Amendment would put new language in these Bill of Rights. And I'd like to read a portion of what is proposed. Okay. The people have the natural, inherent, and inalienable right to a clean and healthy environment, including water, air, soil, flora, fauna, ecosystems, and climate, and to the protection of the natural, cultural, and scenic and healthful qualities of the environment. So the, the objective in being able to put this amendment forward and again, to bring it for before the citizens of the state in this upcoming fall, is in order to be able to promote better, more refined government decision making. Because the Green Amendment would constitutionally mandate that our state government officials protect the environmental rights of all uh, and into the future. So this is a significant uh, piece of legislation. Uh, it will be discussed extensively within Senate committee. Uh, it will be discussed extensively through House committees, and uh, we will see how it goes forward. Very interesting. So what would, um, or do you know what the actions would be as a result of that being in our Constitution? If uh, somebody, you know, said, my water is, is no longer clean, my rights under the Green Amendment have been violated, um, then what happens? Well, let, let, let's take it specifically in terms of uh, uh, what, what it's designed to do in, to, in terms of promoting better government decision making. Uh, okay. The example that you lift up would, would imply that some kind of permitting process would have had to gone on uh, in the first place. So uh, potentially, uh, if that permitting process was judged by this citizen to have been uh, uh, in ineffectively or inappropriately looking at their environmental rights for clean water, that might uh, create the opportunity uh, for them to be able to uh, call upon this amendment and bring action. Clearly, one of the concerns on the part of the legislators that are not supporting the Green Amendment is that it uh, could theoretically open the doors to a wide variety of claims and legal actions uh, that would bring considerable legal expense uh, for, the, for the government entities defending this. But uh, in the two states where there is a Green Amendment, those are Pennsylvania and those are Montana, uh, those kind of cases are really rather well, rather well uh, rare. So uh, the, uh, the conversation continues and uh, we will learn over the course of uh, these next two or three weeks whether it's successful in this second attempt to move it forward or whether or not the supporters will need to bring it back in a future year. Very interesting. Very interesting. We're going to have to watch that very closely. Um, and if anyone's wondering how to watch what's happening at the legislature, you can get on um, the New Mexico legislature website. You can search for bills by keyword. Uh, you can find out which committees they're being heard in. Um, and I haven't checked this year, but um, I assume there are webcasts like there were last year. Do you uh, yes, there are on, on that NM Ledge site. Uh, there's a tab that lets you see the uh, uh, live stream of the committees when they were uh, in action. And then if you go to the left side of that screen, after they've concluded their business for the day, uh, you can click on and find the one that, that went in previous hours uh, and watch it there as well. All right. And can people go in person? Uh, what are the COVID restrictions this year? The roundhouse is open. Uh, there is a requirement to be able to uh, be masked and to have your vaccination status. 
but uh, citizens are uh, available and open to be present uh, in the roundhouse to go into the committee rooms. Uh, so uh, it's it's modified, uh, but not nearly as locked down as it was during the 2021 long session. All right, good to know. Good to know. So what else should we um, be watching for in this session? Well, I mentioned that the governor has the opportunity to put in her message or her call uh, other acts. So one of the ones that's important uh, for Governor Lujan Grisham is to be able to put into legislative language to create a bill, have a bill passed uh, that deals with clean future and addresses the question of uh, net zero greenhouse gas emissions. So let's kind of put this in perspective. Um, in January of 2019, in one of the first actions that the governor took, she issued an executive order. And that executive order was to be able to uh, put forward uh, a statement of uh, drawing down statewide greenhouse gas emissions at that time in her proposal <clears throat> by 45% by the year uh, 2030, based upon a 2005 level. Now, last fall, uh, recall that the governor had the opportunity to be a guest and to participate in the climate conference that the United Nations hosted, the Conference of the Parties, number 26, held in Glasgow, Scotland. And repeatedly uh, in Glasgow at COP26, our governor stated that it's one thing to be able to put forward an executive order. We've seen this at the state level. We've seen it at the national level. But it's quite another to be able to put those objectives of an administration into law. So the Clean Futures Act, now coming forward in a House bill, House Bill Number 6, is intended to be able to codify those broad goals that she had originally outlined in her executive order. Uh, the uh, specific, not 45% by 2030, but in fact, a ratcheting up to meet 50% uh, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions level by 2030. Beyond that, it sets a very new important goal that by 2050, the emissions in the state shall achieve at least net zero emissions, provided that they don't exceed 10% of the levels in 2005 uh, in that uh, 2050 year. The bill also includes specific language that would require the departments to be able to issue reports on an annual basis, bring those back to the legislature, and asking them specifically to be able to ask about the programs, resources, and legislation needed to be able to advance the work uh, toward uh, reduced emissions across those departments. So it's a very uh, it's a very important bill. It has the uh, the backing of the governor. It has the backing of the secretary of the environment, of course. And uh, as I indicated, it was one of the three environmental climate action goals that were on her message or call. Very impactful. Very impactful. One thing that's important about this, in addition to her executive order, is it'll survive um, through future governors. You know, existing executive orders tend to go by the wayside when a new governor takes office or a new president takes office. Um, so that'll certainly be very interesting to watch. We need we need this action. There's a lot going on um, at the U.S. level that we've been uh, hearing about in the news over the last few months and. Um, and, you know, at that conference of parties before, it's really, um, I like your analogy of the um, stacking dolls. Um, sorry, what are those dolls called? That go uh, Russian, Russian stack dolls, or the word in Russian stack is dolls. Matrushka. Yeah. Right. Matrushka. Yeah, yeah, how, you know, everything is kind of coming down from international action to, to national action state level action and ultimately to, well, you know, a local action and individual action. When, when the state's working on, um, you know, greening their facilities, greening their, their transportation and whatnot, we at the city of Santa Fe end up, end up working together on, uh, you know, whether it be um, signage for electric vehicle charging stations or talking to each other about, um, you know, benefits of electric vehicles and things like that, talking to each other about recycling, um, you know, working on on energy efficiency upgrades in our buildings together. So one of the benefits of being the municipality where the state government is housed is, um, you know, we can all learn from each other and 
work to advance our collective goals. Here in Santa Fe, we have a carbon neutral goal of doing so by 2040. That was approved by our governing body in 2018. Um, and we're working, uh, you know, we're not waiting until 2030, 2035, you know, we're working every day on, on making things better, including a $17 million investment on our facilities to do energy efficiency upgrades, water conservation upgrades, um, and solar arrays um, at, at many facilities. And um, so I'm just saying it's great to see all these things happening in tandem. This is a time when we need we need hope, and I'm going to be watching that that bill very closely. I, uh, with it being on a uh, priority of the governor, um, is it fair to say that its chances are pretty good, or is it all just dependent on what happens in the next 20 days or whatever it is? <laughs> well, I think we may hear the first reading of the bill uh, tomorrow, and uh, we will get an indication in terms of the support for it and the opposition uh, to it. Uh, but uh, I think it's reasonable to assume that as one of her priorities, that the Democratic members of the Senate and the House will be uh, potentially predisposed uh, to helping it move forward. Right, right. And if you're just tuning in, this is Climate Matters, your monthly sustainability radio show brought to you by the city of Santa Fe. I'm Neil Denton, and I'm talking with Gary Payton of the Coalition of Sustainable Communities New Mexico about sustainability and you know uh, environmental bills that are being discussed at the state legislature right now a uh, number of exciting things to watch including the um clean fuel standard that's uh that's one of those three priorities of the governor right gary uh, that's right uh, and the clean fuel standard again this is a uh, a second go at this one uh it, it was originally discussed in 2021 but the uh, governor through the Energy Department has brought it back this year. The Clean Fuel Standard Act is really a bill that focuses on the carbon intensity of the fuels used in transportation. Back one more time when we talk about the transportation sector. When we're talking about greenhouse gas emissions at large, we need to remember that, that those greenhouse gas emissions come from multiple places. They come from different sectors in our society. Uh, electricity production, um, agriculture, transportation, oil and gas, uh, in, industrial processes, uh, etc. And over the course of the last three years, uh, this administration has stepped forward aggressively to address greenhouse gas emissions in, for example, the ele electricity sector. Uh, we had the uh, Energy Transition Act passed a couple of years ago. We've subsequently had the Community Solar Act that uh, is now working the final details of the rulemaking uh, in the Public Regulations uh, Commission. We've had a grid modernization bill move through. But it's not just enough. It's not enough at all to be able to just look at one sector. So the transportation sector uh, is uh, another major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So by focusing upon the carbon intensity of fuels, it uh, it is another way to be able to reduce the overall, the aggregate greenhouse gas emissions in the state. Um, the bill would require that fuel producers and importers of fuels into the state reduce their carbon in their fuels by 20%, by 2030, by 30%, by, uh, by 2040. There are already similar programs in place in Oregon and California, and they they require, just as this would does, a gradual improvement in the production processes. One of the clear economic development upsides of this bill is that there's an expectation that it would create new industry uh, with good uh, paying jobs here in the state of New Mexico for this kind of uh, uh, improved fuel production. So uh, we, will, we will see how, how this one moves forward. But as we've indicated, this is the second uh, of the three that's on her call and will indeed fit into the overall objective of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and our associated climate impact. Something I really like about this bill is that it's it's moving upstream to the production scale, the manufacturing scale. You know, so much of messaging for decades um, about sustainability you know, whether it be recycling or energy conservation, so much of it goes down to the individual level. You know, we're saying, uh, 
you know, try try driving less, take your bicycle more, uh, you know, or buy an electric vehicle, um, or you know, try to live in a place where you can take transit and so on and so forth. But so much of the impact on um, the change in climate comes from you know manufacturing and industry and things that are really hard to have an impact on. So this this bill requires people bringing gasoline, diesel, other fuels into New Mexico to reduce the impact of those fuels before they, you know, basically before they cross our border into our state. But for you, you're putting gasoline into your car or diesel into your truck, just the same. Um, it's not going to require different engines, or anything like that. Um, and some of the uh, producers of the fuels, um, if they're not able to reduce the carbon intensity in the production, um, they might be buying carbon offsets, carbon credit. Uh, is, is that right, Gary? Do, do you know anything about that? Well, I, I think the the offset portion of this is probably uh, still to be uh, to be worked out. Maybe that's that's something that needs to be covered from a, uh, the regulatory perspective. But but I, I agree with you com completely that across all of these sectors, the further we push it back up the chain to be able to add to what we're doing here at the municipal level or at the individual level, uh, the greater chances that we may indeed uh, be able to accelerate our drawdown in greenhouse gas emissions. Definitely. So that that clean fuel standard will definitely be an interesting one to watch. Um, I don't believe it is expected to have a substantial impact on the cost and operations of the fuel importers, but it will have a big impact um, on our environment that we all share um, and the uh, climate threats that that we're facing should we not make a pretty sharp turn in our trajectory here. Um, the governor started talking about uh, a somewhat new topic uh, in the last year or so, and I believe that's her third priority we'll be getting to, um, and it's regarding a hydrogen hub. Uh, what's going on with hydrogen, Gary? Well, I, I would assert that this is probably one of the more uh, controversial subjects uh, that the legislature will be dealing with in the environmental sector during this. Uh, the governor became an outspoken proponent that the state of New Mexico should be one of the four places that the federal government chooses to support in order to be able to uh, enhance uh, the production of uh, hydrogen and as another fuel source to be able to be available in those aspects of industry uh, that can not necessarily be affected by these other uh, changes. Uh, long haul trucking, uh, maybe a, uh, potentially aviation, maybe potentially uh, maritime uh, shipping. So she had a very high profile uh, in uh, Glasgow, Scotland. She had a pri uh, higher profile even earlier in the fall about lifting up the idea that our state should become uh, a, uh, a hub for uh, hydrogen could, uh, production that could, could move to, to uh, move forward uh, to, to support industry needs in the next few years. The bill is one that would uh, create uh, hydrogen and hydrogen production and energy generation income tax credits in order to be able to uh, support those hydrogen facilities that uh, would flow from the oil and gas industry. Uh, it would establish criteria uh, for the approval of the hydrogen hub projects uh, et, et cetera. But I will share with you that uh, there's been a tremendous amount of pushback, uh, both by environmental groups, as well as legislators and others from across the community. The uh, One of the principal concerns is that in order to be able to produce hydrogen for these purposes, it really requires converting methane, one of the most significant greenhouse gases, uh, breaking it down into its hydrogen components would actually require more fracking in our community and potentially releasing even more carbon dioxide in the process. It's not a challenge to hydrogen per se, but rather, just as we commented with fuels, it's backing it up the production chain. It has some significant uh, environmental justice impacts, particularly for people in northwestern New Mexico. Uh, I've been reading about the pushback from uh, members within uh, 
uh, the Navajo Nation who are trying to be able to protect the area around Greater Chaco as an example. Those communities have uh, been affected by years from the methane release, the environmental justice issues associated with that. So there's pushback uh, across a broad sector uh, of the environmental community and indigenous communities uh, potentially affected by this. When the uh, bill was discussed in the interim committees in the fall, there were legislators who said, perhaps we're moving too quickly on this one. Uh, this is a very important issue to study relative to the benefits, relative to the costs. Uh, uh, are we not rushing this too swiftly? So it's we will hear the conversation about the Hydrogen Production Act over the course of the next two or three weeks, but there is a potential as well that a Senate memorial will be lifted up that will say, let's slow down a little bit. Let's take the time to be able to study this thoroughly over the course of the next year uh, and bring back pros and cons that can be reviewed in the legislative session in early 2023. Yeah, that makes sense. Certainly it's a very um, complicated subject with many pros and cons. So I'm sure those committee hearings will be um, very packed with uh, people testifying on, on with both sides of the issue. So it certainly makes sense for there to be a memorial to better study it and come back in the next 60 day session. Um, so so what else should we talk about coming up in the in the coming days at the roundhouse? Well, I, I think one of the other uh, topics that's had a fair amount of uh, visibility here in the greater Santa Fe area has been the conversation about whether or not uh, the uh, municipalities, cities should have the opportunity to be able to move forward with their own public power, their own public power uh, utilities. So there uh, is a bill that's been introduced by uh, Representative Andrea Romero that would call the call for the technical feasibility study for state level public utility model for New Mexico. The idea was discussed within the PRC uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, the, the PRC, uh, I think, ha has its own questions about entity to be able to do something like this. Uh, but the memorial uh, will bring that question uh, forward and we'll see whether or not uh, that it uh, that it moves house as well. Uh, the just interesting aspects about public power are that our current model uh, in the main, most of the citizens in New Mexico are served by one of our three investor owned utilities for those here in and around Santa Fe, that means PNM. But uh, these are investor owned utilities uh, that have a responsibility to be able to uh, produce profit that can go to their shareholders. With the availability of sun and wind, with the availability of the expansion of renewable energy here in our state, it seems like a reasonable question that using the public utility model those profits that often go to shareholders can then move back in a public utility perspective into the coffers and general funds of the, uh, uh, of the public utilities and the, and the cities. There are over 2,000 public power utilities around the United States. And typically, they are able to reduce the cost of electricity to the supply, their uh, uh, citizens, uh, and they are often more reliable than the investor owned utilities. So this uh, memorial that's moving forward will be to, uh, uh, again, propose a study, bring back the ideas and see whether or not uh, something like this should be uh, advanced more formally in legislation in future years. Very interesting. Well, you know, I for one find it very exciting to see democracy in action. I know it can be a little dull sitting through some committee meetings, sitting through, uh, the general meetings in the House chambers and the Senate chambers, but um, to uh, you know, head down to the roundhouse or tune into the webcast, you know, whichever your preference, and um, and just see democracy in action, see um, see the gears turning, and and recognize um, the ability that you have to to influence those decisions, whether it's 
calling your senator or your representative um, or signing up to testify in favor or against a bill. Uh, I know I've, you know, I've called my senator's office before and just say, hey, I'd like to you know, let the senator know I'm in favor of this bill. Um, and, uh, and they say, okay, you know, we've taken note. And, you know, that sort of thing makes a difference when those, um, when our representatives and our senators are, are in the committee and on the floor making decisions. So that's just my pitch to get engaged with our democracy here in New Mexico, being a relatively small state. Um, each citizen can have a bigger impact. It's easier to, to talk to your, your elected officials um, and, to, uh, and to influence the decisions that are happening in the state. So head over to the New Mexico legislature website. As I mentioned, you can search for keywords. Uh, if you don't remember everything we've talked about, you can just type in you know, climate or water or what have you and find the bills that have those in them and uh, get involved. So that is the end of our show here. This has been Climate Matters, your monthly sustainability show brought to you by the city of Santa Fe. I'm Neil Denton. I'm the sustainability officer here at the city. Uh, we bring you this show every fourth Wednesday, 8.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. on Suave Radio. Uh, thank you so much for being my guest today, Gary. Thank you very much, Neil, for the invitation. Yeah, I'm sure uh, we'll have you on again. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Uh, and I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. Farewell. Farewell.